Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Widener Show. If you like the Mike Widener Show and you want to make your own podcast, well, let me tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. Secondly, there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can also add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. You can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, many more. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get started. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. Hi, this is me, I'm Austin Zell known as me no time for love check out my latest book missing available in print and ebook formats on amazon it's now time for the mike wagner show powered by sonic web studios visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs the mike wagner show can be heard on spreaker spotify iHeartRadio, youtube itunes anchor fm radio public and the mike wagner show.com mike brings you great guests and interesting people from all across the globe so sit back relax and enjoy another great episode of the mike wagner show Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by SoundCrab Studios. Visit online at SoundCrabStudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. SoundCrab Studios is the answer. SoundCrab Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at SoundCrabStudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing is fast paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is an illusion and those you love will be the first to go missing. It's available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews in Evil Love and Endorsed by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassidy, Forge Riley, and Manales. So grab your copy today for Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 30 podcast platforms, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple Music, and more. Take us with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Weiner Show on Instagram and Twitter today for great gift ideas. Go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Weiner Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags makes great gifts. 24-7, 365 for family, friends, students, teachers, and more. Also, for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson ZM for great books like Missing, Once, Wrinkles. Also, cool T-shirts, great pop sockets, cool hoodies, and great phone cases. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson ZM. Also, support the Mike Weiner Show on Anchor FM along with PayPal and the Mike Show.com. Make sure you do so today. He's back by popular demand, and he's always a joy to be on as well, too. I learned a lot from this excellent gentleman. He appears on uh, Coast to Coast, and you can uh, catch him on Wednesday nights, if I'm correct on that one. And he's called The Next Lineage of Seminal Thinkers and The Next Stephen Hawking, according to uh, British TV. And he's author of seven books, publishes for several musicians, published and lectured on scholarly um, conferences in 12 different fields, and involved in two different $2 billion moon prize. We talked about it. And of course, if you want to get all the information, just go to MikeWidenerShow.com and check out uh, Mike Widener Show interviewing Howard Bloom. And this time, let's put on our thinking caps and let's um, get in our seats. We're going to talk about the Howard Bloom Institute. And live, ladies and gentlemen, from the Plus Studios in his, um, in his uh, office here, ladies and gentlemen, the multi-talented and professor, Howard Bloom. Howard, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us once again. Mike, it's a pleasure to see you again. Oh, it's always a pleasure as well, too. And, um, and of course, we had you on before. We last talked about the uh, $2 billion um, moon prize, and I'm sure that went very well. I was uh, very excited about it. And plus, um, you know, not only that, you also started your own Howard Bloom Institute. And I love to hear more about where it's the truth that any price, including the price of your life. I love that one. <laughs> well, uh, the Howard Bloom Institute started because uh, there's a 62-minute film called The Grand Unified Theory of Howard Bloom. It's won two festival prizes so far. And in that film, the filmmaker decided to follow me as I was heading into Manhattan to finalize a will that would leave all of my property to one of my biggest fans um, so that he could start a Howard Bloom Institute. And the idea 
was to keep my ideas, my peculiar way of thinking, and believe me, it is peculiar, Mike, um, alive long after I'm gone. Um, so I started to get um, emails from people who had seen the film saying, I'd like to be a part of the Howard Bloom Institute. And initially I said, well, there is no Howard Bloom Institute as yet. And then I realized, hey, we have a bunch of these people. If we get them together to work together, then they are a Howard Bloom Institute. So the Howard Bloom Institute is up and running. A whole mess of things have happened with it, um, even though we only officially launched about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And a million units, units of a cryptocurrency, thought is the name of the cryptocurrency, wow. have been dedicated to the Howard Bloom Institute. Um, I never imagined music as having anything to do with the Howard Bloom Institute, even though, you know, I worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, Bette Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss, Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, people like that. And despite that, music is not at the heart of my work, or I haven't thought it was at the heart of my work. But our first piece of music um, came out about two weeks ago. It's called Aeon of Light. It's by uh, someone in Britain named Sean King. Mm. I guess he goes under the name of Planet Frog or Hugh Mann um, these days. But um, so that piece of music came out. It's it's startling. It's extraordinarily powerful. And there's a second piece of music that's in the works. Um, back in 2001, I put together a um, a, a piece of poetry that encapsulates my grand unified theory of everything in the universe, including sex, violence, and the human soul. Mm -hmm. Well, my girlfriend persuaded me to read it to the members of the Howard Bloom Institute. And I did. And one of them said, wait, I represent a record company um, here in Minneapolis. Um, I want to do something with that piece of poetry, something musical. So he introduced it to a group called Airship Caravan, who are very good. And Airship Caravan has uh, written the instrumental music, and now it's about to put in the vocals mm. for our second piece of music. Um, there's a whole lot more. We have our own NFTs, which is something I also never imagined, non-fungible tokens. The first one is based on a uh, the most astonishing piece of needlework as art that I have ever seen in my life. It is a Luther Vandross jacket. Wow. And I was given this Luther Vandross tour jacket back in the early 1980s um, when if you confess that you were gay, it was the end of your career. And I really mean the end of your career. Huh. And this gave people who were gay, like Elton John, George Michael, who was a client of mine, um, and Luther Vandross, a serious problem. So Luther managed to put out uh, I, I'm gay and loud and proud statement not verbally, but in a tour jacket. So the tour jacket is plum purple on the outside with pink piping and pink lettering. And on the inside, it is bright fluorescent pink with gray lettering and gray piping. Wow. And it is an absolute, and Mike, you wouldn't believe it if you saw it. So the NFT company took this and they made a 3D model of it. And they and their display of the 3D model on the NFT is breathtaking. It's mm. absolutely gorgeous. So that's our first NFT. And I believe that there's a second one involved with Run DMC um, coming out almost any day now. So those are a few. I mean, we, we've set up um, a couple of initiatives. Um, one is a, uh, an engineer in Scotland is working to turn Garden the Solar System Green the Galaxy, which is a, a visual manifesto that I wrote for the future of humanity and the future of life, um, into a short animation using a university class that's specializing in animation. And we'll see how he makes out, but he's done this twice in the past, and it's always worked out so far. We're just trying for something a little bit more ambitious. Um, omnology is a field that I laid down a manifesto for again in 2001 seems to have been a fruitful year mm. and i had uh, at that time i was stuck in bed um 
So two people came over to my house. One is my mentor in neuroscience from NYU, and he brought a friend of his from Yale. And I laid out omnology and said, how do we make this academically? Um, uh, how do we give it academic substance? And they were baffled and they couldn't answer the question. Hmm. And what is well, uh, omnology for the uh, listening audience out there? OK, the uh, omnology is a discipline for the promiscuously curious. Mm. Um, it is a discipline for the omnivorously curious. It's there so that when you're in your sophomore year of college and huh. you're and you're well, let, let's do something else before that. Omnology derives from omni means all. Logos is knowledge. Um, and uh, it derives from a simple sense I had when I was 10 years old and first got involved in science, that science is about the aspiration to omniscience. And so since uh, it, it is about aspiring to omniscience in some way. So it's there so that when your dad sits you down in your sophomore year of college and he says to you, look, you're interested in art history, you're interested in neuroscience and you're interested in film. You got to make up your mind. Are you going to be an art historian? Are you going to be a neuroscientist? Or are you going to be a filmmaker? Until you make up your mind, you're nothing. Oh. And omnology is there so you can say. <laughs> you, you took it from Leland Sklar, I'll tell you that. <laughs> right. so, um, so and we you love can, you, yes. <laughs> right. So, so it's there so you can say, look, Dad, these are my three interests. These are my three passion points. These are the things that drive me, the curiosities that drive me. I will pursue all these curiosities for as long as they stay alive and passionate inside of me. And if new ones come along, I will pursue them too. Mm -hmm. And when I and my friends all hit the age of 40, and my friends have no clue as to why they're on this planet, and the women are planning elaborate divorces to find themselves, and the men are buying little red sports cars and picking up blondes and cheating on their wives, all because they don't have a clue as to why they are here on this planet. I will just be coming back from the wilderness of my multiple curiosities for the first time with my first answers. And while my friends feel they are at the end of their lives, I will know I'm at the beginning of mine. Hmm. So that's what omnology is there for. No matter what your collection of interests if you follow them with all the passion that's in you, your collection of curiosities, eventually you will become capable of seeing a big picture that no specialist will be able to see. Um, a lot of this started when I was 16 years old. I was working at the world's largest cancer research center over the summer. And they put a, a real legitimate scientist over my head to make sure that I didn't break too many test tubes and I didn't damage too many multi-million dollar photospectrometers. <laughs> um, and he took me to his office for the first time. And his office was a windowless cubicle, um, but it had a desk built into the wall that was about six feet long. And on the left of that desk were three stacks of books. On the right of that desk were another three stacks of books. All the books were in German. And this scientist, Phil Fish, was had been trying for three years to synthesize just one complex molecule. Huh. And he said, you see those books on the right? Those are the books I've finished to be able to synthesize that molecule, this molecule. See the books on the left? Those are the books I have yet to read before I can synthesize this molecule. And in other words, he was going to be doing this for five years of his life one molecule. And I realized that is not the kind of science I want to do. Bill Fish is digging the equivalent of a hole in the ground for a prairie dog. Um, and in the process of digging it, he has cut himself off from all the light. And all he can see, if he can see anything at all, is the darkness and the earthen walls around him. That is not what I want to do. I want to be able to fly over the landscape of all of the sciences and use the specializations as pixels in a big picture. And if you follow your multiple curiosities, you too, by the time you're 40, will begin to come up with a vision of the big picture that contributes to science, because specialists, can all, like Phil Fish, can only exist if they have questions to pursue. And the people who come up with the questions are the omnologists. The people who fly over the landscape of all of the scientists like Charles Darwin did, like Leonardo da Vinci did. 
and see the big picture and bring it back to the rest of us. From that big picture come the new set of questions for the next generation of specialists to dig in. Mm -hmm. So Omnology is one of our major projects, and Kepler Space University in Florida has asked us to put together a four- to six-week course on Omnology. So that's our toehold in academia. Um, the uh, Phi Beta Kappa chapter in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, is interested in making that course available to their people as well. And the ultimate goal, the program is being run by Cheyenne G, who is a research scientist who has been an omnologist since she was five years old, and but had no name for it, and as a consequence was just considered an oddball, mm -hmm. even in her own mind. And if she had had that term, it would have validated her. It would have justified her when she was five. So her goal is to ultimately get down to five-year-olds. Wow. With this approach. So there's a, a, so those are two projects, the Garden of the Solar System, Green the Galaxy, and Omnology. There is another one that I plan to get off the ground in January, um, and it is saving Western civilization, saving really? the values of Western civilization. Why? Because every system of belief that grabs hold of our idealism um, makes the claim that it is, it is going to lift the poor and the oppressed. But the Western system has done that more than any other system in the history of the planet. And what do I mean? If you had been the poorest paid uh, worker in England in uh, 1850, um, you would have earned a seventh of what the poorest paid worker earns today. In other words, the poorest paid worker in London earns what an entire tenement full of Irish stock workers earned in 1850. Wow. If you've been uh, born in the Western system in 1850, your life expectancy would have been 38.5 years. If you've been born in the Western system in 2000, your life expectancy would have been 78.5 years. Mm -hmm. In other words, we more than doubled the human lifespan with the Western system. Um, we added 40 more years to the average lifespan. Um, if you took a Stanford Binet IQ test from 1916, the first year it was administered, and gave it to 100 random kids on the street, kids who've allegedly been shallowed and dumbed down by the internet, they their, their average IQ would measure at marginal genius at 135. In other words, we've added 35 IQ points um, to the average kid since 1916. Wow. And if you've been born in either in the Western system in 1650 or in one of those lovely indigenous tribes that lives in harmony with nature and at peace with its fellow man, um, your odds of dying a violent death at the hands of a fellow human being would have been 10 times what they are today. In other words, we have increased the peace in the world by a factor of 10. So if our great-great-grandparents could add 40 years to our lifespan, then surely we owe another 40 years to our great-great-grandkids. If our great-great-grandparents could add 35 points to our IQ, then surely we owe another 35 points to our great-great-grandkids. If our great-great-grandparents could increase the peace in the world, by a factor of 10, then surely we owe our great-grandkids increasing the peace by another factor of 10. But to do these things, we have to avoid destroying the system that has produced this. And what is the Western system? The Western system, it's, this is in my book, The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism. The Western system is a balance between three elements that are always pulling against each other. Um, and one is government. You know, government builds things like the Internet and roadways. Mm -hmm. um, uh, second is private enterprise. Um, and right now, private enterprise is giving us our, our a Mars program, thanks to Elon Musk, that NASA cannot give us, has mm -hmm. not been able to give us. And the third element is the protest industry. And the protest industry is a self-correction device. And the protest industry has been around as long as the Industrial Revolution. It came to life in the 1760s as a move, movement against slavery. And by 1806, it had, had abolished slavery in England, not in the United States, 
but in England. Mm -hmm. So we need these three, three elements working against each other. Now, China is trying an experiment. Under Deng Xiaoping in 1980, China adopted the Western system um, with its three elements pulling against each other. And um, now Xi Jinping is trying to bring that back to a Marxist-Leninist socialist model. And so he is keeping private enterprise. He is more than keeping government. He's beefing, beefing it up. Um, but he's getting rid of the protest industry. So China is going to be, for the next 20 years, a great experiment in whether you can have a culture that's as vigorous as Western culture without a protest industry, without oh, a social device. Wow. So the Saving Western Civilization Project, I'm going to try to kick off in January. Um, volunteers for that project include uh, David Patterson, former governor of New York State, Harry Hamlin, the founder of, a, excuse me, a nuclear fusion company, and also the actor who was voted the sexiest man alive in mm -hmm. 1987 by People magazine. He's best known for his role as Perseus in Clash of the Titans and several other people who are anxious to get into this. Um, so those are our basic projects, aside from whatever we do with keeping my work alive. And I write between one and three pieces a week, which are put up in our newsletter um, and on the website. So if you go to howardbloom.institute, um, you can find these new pieces that I spill out. I mean, I get a homework assignment every Wednesday. From Coast to Coast, the highest rated overnight talk radio show in North America, because I do a three and a half minute news segment at 106 in the morning, Eastern time, every Wednesday night. And I never know what they're going to assign to me. And they give me about five hours notice. And then I have to, <laughs> I have to research it and become the world's greatest expert on whatever topic it is, or to the best of my ability, I have to try to do that and write a script. So that script always comes out. Meanwhile, I've been working on my next book which probably won't come out until 2023, but it's the case of the sexual cosmos. Everything you know about nature is wrong. And as I finish the drafts of the chapters, um, those have gone up um, in the newsletter and on my YouTube channel huh. um, as well. That's really interesting. What, what's the book about, by the way? Just uh, not give away um, too much. So The book is about the fact that there are some assumptions in science that are absolutely untrue. And one is the law of least effort. Nature goes about everything in the thriftiest manner possible. She does not. Nature is wildly indulgent. We think we are the source of consumerism, materialism, and vain display. We are not. Materialism, consumerism, and vain display have existed in nature ever since nature invented sex about a billion years ago. Um, look at a peacock's tail. That's the arch example. That is waste, indulgence, and vain display. That is materialism, consumerism, and vain display. But it is useful for females. Hmm. Because a male who can possibly have magnificent tail feathers and not get eaten by a hawk, um, <laughs> and those tail feathers are just a billboard for hawks, come and get me, um, is put through a, a kind of uh, selective sieve um, before he's able to inseminate the females. So this does the females a favor. They don't have to go out and challenge um, the, the woes and griefs of nature. Um, the males can do it on their behalf and then come back with genes that have been proven through use and proven through the greatest difficulties you can possibly imagine, like that enormous tail that makes it almost impossible for you to fly, for God's sakes. Shame on NBC on that one for those peacocks. Yes. Shame on NBC. <laughs> yes, exactly. So the basic premise of the book is that the law of least effort doesn't work. Um, and the law of entropy doesn't work in this cosmos. And this shows you how materialism, consumerism, waste and vain display have been alive in nature for at least a billion years. And But there's a, a fascinating, amazing story um behind it mm. um so that's what that book is about i'm working on three chapters on anne boleyn right now because her relationship with um king henry the eighth was very expensive for everybody wow both for king henry and it was expensive for her but 
this a strange thing that sex is all about. It's producing one of a kinds. It's producing oddballs. Mm-hmm. And um, when oddballs sense a commonality, that's when they get together. That's when mm-hmm. they fall in love with each other. That's when they mate. Um, and the result of this mating between Anne Boleyn and uh, Henry VIII was not just Anne Boleyn's beheading, which mm-hmm. was an unfortunate consequence. It was the birth of a daughter. Um, and that daughter was Queen Elizabeth, the first Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth was so consequential to England that they, we refer to an Elizabethan era. I mean, it produced, among other things, um, a, a whole new kind of theater. And the town fathers in London wanted to shut that new form of theater down because they said it was all about sex and violence. And young people were going to these uh, theatrical displays and were being exposed to sex and violence, and it was going to corrupt their morals. So the town fathers put out an absolute edict that this entire theater industry should be shut down. And but but the queen Elizabeth loved the new theater, and she kept it alive and open um, despite the town fathers of London. Um, why? Because Queen Elizabeth was an oddball. So you put the right oddball, oddball in the right circumstances. Um, which only happens one in a billion times or something like that. And all of a sudden, there is the equivalent of a tornado in the forces of history. Wow. Um, And things change. So that's what these three chapters that are the concluding chapters of the book are about. But I I research every sentence I write, Mike. Um, And sometimes it can take me several days just to research a sentence or a paragraph. Huh, that's fascinating. I wish I had the time in the world to um, research my sentences and paragraphs. It's like, I'm only allowed maybe about five or ten seconds. That's how fast it's been for me. <laughs> right. And and it's hard for me to find the time, too, because I'm running four space groups, including the $2 billion Moon Prize group that you alluded to. And we just pulled off a meeting between David Patterson, who is the former governor of New York State, um, Robert Walker, who is the former head of the House Science Committee. Robert is a Republican. Um, David is a Democrat. And Bill Nelson, who is the head of NASA. And the idea was to open the, our door um, to NASA or to open NASA's door to us. Um, so um, this group is, is very much alive um, and kicking. And so are the other groups. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running too many groups right now. Well, that's a good thing, too, because I remember we were on. We had a great discussion about the space race and everything else. It was between Elon Musk and um, Richard Branson as well, too. It makes you wonder who's the third person going to be. Maybe it could be you. Who knows? No, the third person is it's the second person. Branson is basically dropped out of the running. Oh, he's he did. Way, way, he, he hasn't dropped out, but he's way, way behind. Um, Bezos, Jeff Bezos. That was a guy. Company. Yeah. He's way, way, way behind. So this is a race between Elon Musk and China. And Elon Musk is disturbed by, well, look, Joe Biden, who's my president, I'm a Democrat, and I very much support Joe Biden. But Joe Biden um, put on an event a month or two ago um, celebrating electric cars. And he had General Motors uh, and he had Chrysler. Um, but he did not have Elon Musk. How can you not have Elon Musk at an event that celebrates electric cars? And, and he's the one that that, that, that uh, revolutionized the electric car, the Tesla. Yes, I mean, exactly. oh, my gosh. Wow. When GM tried to put out the electric car, it failed. Um, and yet, because Joe Biden is so union oriented, he locked um, he locked Elon Musk out of this event because Elon Musk is not unionized. Mm. And then Elon Musk apparently pointed out on Twitter that his workers are paid more than the unionized workers at General Motors. Really? So America right now, NASA, when it comes to human spaceflight, is totally dysfunctional. Totally. And only Elon Musk is getting Americans into space on American vehicles. There was an 11-year gap, and we couldn't do that. Now, NASA helped fund Elon to develop his Dragon capsule, um, but... Uh, NASA couldn't have pulled it off by itself. Now NASA is developing, or Elon is developing a starship. What's a starship? In the past, we've taken about three astronauts at a time 
to space in small capsules, including the Dragon capsule, which is built for a maximum, I believe, of seven. Um, the Starship will carry 100 passengers and all of their luggage um, to space and ultimately to Mars. Mm -hmm. um, that's a radically different scale, and it changes the relationship between life and the cosmos. And what do I mean by that? When you take you, if I took you to space, Mike. I go. <laughs> yes, you don't realize it, but I'm taking an entire ecosystem. Why? Because you are 100 trillion cells. But 90 trillion of those cells don't even claim to be you. Um, they're bacterial colonies. They're bacterial colonies garrisoning your nose and your throat against outside invaders. They're bacterial colonies in your gut that actually digest the food that you eat and make mm. your vitamins B and vitamin K. You can't live without them. So I'm taking a large community of communities, huh. community of 100 trillion cells that's you, the communities of, uh, of 7 trillion cells apiece that are the bacterial colonies that live inside you and allow you to continue to live. I'm taking an ecosystem to space. We have to garden and green the place. We have to take plants to space. We have to have farming in space. Ultimately, we have to build parks in space. And all of that is consistent with a vision laid out by a guy named Gerard O'Neill at Princeton University in the 1980s, who mapped out how we could have gardens and parks in space. Mm -hmm. um, we, we owe it to the rest of the living species on Earth. Why? Because once upon a time, 3.85 billion years ago, this planet was a poison pill of stone and the mother not just of climate change, but the mother of climate catastrophe. Um, just if you had been on the surface of this planet 3.85 billion years ago, um, every three hours, your temperature would have shot up 88 degrees. Um, and you would have been exposed to this poisonous stuff called radiation. And every three hours, your temperature would have plunged again 88 degrees, and you would have been expo exposed to something equally toxic called darkness. And yet, in the environment of smoldering volcanoes of uh, a solar system that circles the core of the galaxy every 235 million years, going through all kinds of dangers that even Frodo the Hobbit would find uh, damning, um, dangers like clouds of galactic fluff, um, uh, streams of gamma rays. Um, this, this is the planet of climate change beyond belief. We've had Two ice ages in which even the equator has frozen over to a half a mile of ice and snow in height. Even wow. the equator. Um, we've had periods of time where dinosaurs have lived at the South Pole because it has been so warm. That's nature that's produced these things. It's not tailpipes and smokestacks. It's nature. And yet life dared to get a toehold on this poison pill of stone in the face of all of these catastrophes and used and, and and was able to harvest some of them. For example, remember that stream of radiation? They hit you for three hours a day. Well, life took that radiation, kidnapped it, and brought it into the metabolic process of life. And we know what they did as photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. They, they took these insubstantial things called photons, uh, parcels of light, and grabbed hold of them and used them in their chemical apparatus. Um, so um, life has survived and thrived in this uh, continuous concatenate of catastrophes um, through daring, through audaciousness, through harvesting every form of garbage and threat, every form of poison and turning it into a tree, to take, from taking every wasteland and turning it into a field of waving grain. Nature has done that through audacity, not through thrift, um, not through being miserly, not through withdrawal um, from advancement, through steady advancement, through what we call progress. And that world word has been in hot debate for 40 years now, wow. progress. Because those who want us to move backwards technologically and want us to get rid of uh, 7 billion people on the planet so that 100 million um, can live in peace and harmony with the petting zoo of nature. Mm -hmm. The petting zoo of nature has never existed. Nature has never been a petting zoo. 
lions, jaguars to feed their kids, they kill. That's monstrous. And that's nature. Um, so, and what we are doing is the precise equivalent to what cyanobacteria, um, green, blue algae, were doing two billion years ago um, when they invented photosynthesis. Um, mm. Be daring, look up. Take the uh, take what comes down from above and bundle it. Use it as a resource. That's the imperative nature is operated according to, and that's the imperative we must operate according to, which means nature welcomes our new technologies. And nature welcomes the fact that we have in the Western system a protest industry, mm -hmm. which can work to, quote, save the planet, unquote. That's a vital part of our system. So we, the Chinese, we're all working toward green goals right mm -hmm. now. We're working to protect nature. But the Western system invented the anti-slavery movement. The Western system invented the anti-colonialism movement. The Western system invented the peace movement. The Western system invented the environmental movement, the movement to save the planet. And China has never done such a thing. In fact, it would not be allowed. If it doesn't these days come from the mind of Xi Jinping, it's illegitimate and forbidden. Huh. Rather interesting. And of course, you know, you talk about these subjects, it makes it makes you think it's like, I'd love to take a class with you in the Howard Bloom Institute. I like to see it in your curriculum. <laughs> well, that would be neat. So uh yes, yeah, so that's uh moving along. And um and I'm glad the Howard Bloom Institute exists. It heartens me because I told you this story before, Mike, in all probability. But when I was 10 years old, I was a lost kid in Buffalo, New York. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. The other kids didn't want to have anything to do with me unless they were picking on me and beating me up. And my parents didn't want to have anything to do with me. Lord knows why. Um, and one day this book appeared in my lap and it said the first two rules of science are these, the truth at any price, including the price of your life. And look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before and then proceed from there. And law number, in terms of rule number one, the truth at any price in your life, gave the example of Galileo. And for the second law, look at things right under your nose, gave the example of Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the man who invented the microscope. So two people reached out across a distance of 350 years and saved me. So my obligation, ever since I was 10 years old, has been to reach out a neck, across the next 350 years and save the next poor kid along the line. And that's really the ultimate goal of the Howard Bloom Institute. And you also got some great members on board, too, like Jeff Bridges as well, too. He's excellent. Peter Garrelson. And he also got, um, you know, Martin Bolgewald and um, Edgar Coons and Lisa Coleman from uh, Prince as well, too. I found that really fascinating. Right. James Burke and more. And, um, oh, my gosh, you got an amazing bunch there. Yeah, it's I was astonished. Because um, I would never have dared approach these people um, about a Howard Bloom Institute. But this, the people who were making the Howard Bloom Institute happen, the core team, did reach out to these people. And the result was astonishing. So we mm -hmm. have Governor David Patterson, the former governor of New York State. We have Robert Walker, the former head of the House Science Committee. We have James Burke, who's the creator of seven BBC TV series including his most famous one, Connections, which is just utterly mind-blowing. And if you can ever get your hands on it, watch it. It will change the way you see the world around you. Um, Richard Foreman, a MacArthur Genius Award winner, who's the god of avant-garde theater. Um, Martin Bojewald, who you just mentioned, but Martin wrote the textbook on quantum cosmology. Huh. Um, a bunch of people from the information Sciences, like scientists from all over the world. We have people from India, London, um, Vienna, um, and Spain, all, all over the place. Um, so it's been fairly amazing to watch it. You know, I, I give an example in, I think it's in Einstein, Michael Jackson, and Me, A Search for Soul and the Power Pits of Rock and Roll, the book that's right behind me, my latest book. So I give you the example of uh, imagine that you and I are in your living room and I go out to your kitchen and I take an entire container of Morton salt and I take an eight ounce glass of water and I pour as much of the container as I can into the water and stir it. So when I bring that 
glass of water out to you in the living room, it looks like I, I ask you what's in it. You say, what do you mean? It's water because it looks just like water. But if I give you just one crystal of salt and you drop it into that water, all of a sudden, all of the salt that's in solution in that water discovers a common home and plums onto that salt crystal. And you end up with a salt crystal three inches wide Wow! in your, in your glass. So that's called the, the liquid that contains all of that salt is called a supersaturated solution. And uh, the crystal that you dropped in is a seed crystal. And uh, the, the Howard Bloom Institute is turning out to be a seed crystal dropped into a supersaturated solution. Oh, my gosh. That's so amazing. You also got some other people on board, too, like Alex Watler, Christopher Cook, Andrew Hacker, and uh, Josh Leet, and um, Stuart Atkinson, Car Carrie Anderson, and more. And, um, I mean, just amazing people on your team as well, too. I mean, you got a lot of people on board. Well, it's an amazing group of people. And we'll see what happens from here because I'm still getting notes from people saying, uh, how can I contribute to this? How can I be a part of it? So we're setting up an activist board for people who want to um, help make this happen in some way. So they can meet roughly three times a year or four times a year, and we can take on practical challenges. But right now, I'm trying to limit the goals to omnology, um, to saving Western civilization, and to garden the solar system, green the galaxy, because you need to concentrate your forces in order to make things happen. Mm -hmm. and, and also, also, what about the space race? Would you also uh, put there as well, too? Yeah, the space race is very important because if China wins the space race, and there's a good chance that it will, because we are not sufficiently focused, because NASA is dysfunctional. Uh, only Elon Musk is carrying us forward. If we lose that space race, it means that the major paradigm on which all social systems will model themselves will be a paradigm that's autocratic, dictatorial, and totalitarian, that does not allow freedom of thought and freedom of speech, that follows the Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin model. Hmm. And, and I would not want to live in a society like that because all I have are my thoughts uh, and my ability to express them. So I would be canceled out of existence in a society like that. And I would imagine an awful lot of the people watching your show feel the same way. They mm -hmm. don't want to be canceled out by a Xi Jinping style or Vladimir Putin style society. And of course, my big fear is being canceled as well, too. So it's just like it's among just about everybody. And of course, you also got music and we don't want that canceled. And, um, you know, just a lot of great music out there. And, um, and and of course, you also allow like any contributions or people submissions or anything like that. Or, you know, you know, in terms of music, what um, or it's just like, you know, you know, tell us more about that. Well, if there are any other people who want to make music, that's welcome. About 20 years ago, a group got in touch with me, I think from Germany, um, and they wanted to name themselves the Lucifer Principle, which is the name of my first book, The Lucifer Principle, The Scientific Expedition into the Forces of History. And I said, yes, I mean, it's a, a form of flattery. They're a dark, heavy metal band. I'm not sure they still exist. It's hard to tell since things stay alive on the Internet long after they've actually died. But, um, yeah, I welcome anybody who's got a contribution to make or who finds that this work of mine is liberating. I mean, there's a tiny little story. In the days when I was working at a cafe called uh, the Chocolateria um, and was writing all of my books there, uh, there was a, an attractive woman sitting near me in her 50s. And after I put in three to four hours of work and needed a break, I asked her who she was. Well, she turns out to be an editor from, I believe, Oxford University Press. Wow. She's the online editor. And she said, what field are you trained in? And I'd never been asked that question before, Mike. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it for a second. And then I said, I haven't been trained in any field. That's been my greatest gift that I haven't been trained in any field. Because when somebody trains you, they train you to think the way they do. Um, they train you to carry out the programs that were their programs and to finish them. Um, they put blinders on your eyes. And fortunately for me, no one has ever tried to do that to me 
Um, and the result is I don't have the kinds of blinders that other people are stuck with. So it's been a huge gift to have no training and yet to be able to contribute articles and lectures in 12 different scholarly fields for everything from quantum physics and cosmology up to evolutionary biology, governance and information science. That's rather interesting. And uh, what else can we expect from you in the uh, Howard Bloom Institute and what are you looking to add, especially come up in uh, 2022 and beyond, Howard? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you can see the Amnology Project move forward uh, by the end of uh, 2022. Um, the Amnology course should be up and running. Um, the uh, Save Western Civilization Project should be up and running by then. Um, Garden the Solar System, Bring the Galaxy, the animation. Um, should be almost finished at that point. Um, and those are our three basic projects, unless I think I'm missing something. God knows what it is. Um, but that's what we really have to concentrate on. And meanwhile, I will finish um, the case of the sexual cosmos. Everything you about know about nature is wrong. Um, and I will find a publisher. And hopefully by the end of 2022, there will be a publisher in place and that book will be on the verge of being available. And I will have to start work on my next book, which is the Gray Unified Theory of Everything in the Universe, including Sex, Violence and the Human Soul, where I try to pull together the elements of all of my books. That is so amazing. Definitely looking forward to having you on Har Bloom once again. Um, Har Bloom, the professor Har Bloom at the Har Bloom Institute and the Mike Widener Show, and uh, called Next Lineage of Seminal Thinkers. Also, uh, author of seven books, published for several musicians, and um, published lectures. You know, just a bunch. And uh, Howard, a very big thank you for your time as always. You always amaze me and learn a lot from you. And once again, um, tell us, um, you know, where can we find you? What's your website? And how people contact? Where can people purchase or check out your works? Well, um, it's uh, http colon slash slash. And here's the real gist of the matter. Howard Bloom dot net. Howard Bloom is all one word and Bloom is spelled with two O's. Um, so Howard Bloom. No, no, wait. It's Howard Bloom dot institute. Sorry. There is a howardbloom.net. That's my personal website. But you can find out more on howardbloom.institute. You can find out tons of different information on each of those, actually. Um, and if you find any of these projects interesting, go to the contact page on howardbloom.institute and let my team know that you're interested. And we'll figure out some way. I will get you the newsletter if you want it, which means you'll get my writing as it comes out of the laptop. And we'll see if we can uh, involve you in some of these projects, if that's what interests you. Again, it's HowardBloom.Institute. That's certainly amazing. We will do so. Once again, Howard, a very big thank you for your time. It's always great to hear from you and looking forward to having you again soon. And we definitely love to have you back on. Just keep us up to date. And you're always welcome on the Mike Wagner Show anytime, Howard. That's terrific. Have a great night, Mike. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley, and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written. It's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter, and it's very well done. I'm going to highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamoshenzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Anchor FM, Radio Public, and themikewagnershow.com. Please support our program with your donations at themikewagnershow.com. 
Join us again next time for another great episode of The Mike Wagner Show. 